everybody. My name is David Bruner. I'm one of the pastors here. It is a joy to be with you as always. Um, I am always happy to be here, but this morning I am particularly happy to be here with all of you, and I am reminded of how much I love and enjoy this church. Um, we are in the middle of a sermon series looking at stories from the Old Testament. And this week, we're looking at a story about the prophet Elijah from 1 Kings 19. Before I read that for you, let's pray together. Good and gracious God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit among us in this time as we hear the words of Holy Scripture. Grant that we might hear your word, understand your word, take it to heart, and apply its message to our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is the Word made flesh. Amen. Here's our reading for this morning. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so that was a reading from the book of 1 Kings. Let me set the stage a little bit for you. 1 Kings is a book in the middle of the Old Testament. As the title suggests, it's a chronicle of the many kings that ruled the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And our passage for today is about Elijah. Elijah is not a king. He's a prophet, and he has the unenviable job of working during the reign of King Ahab or, and Queen Jezebel. Raise your hand if you know who King Ahab or Queen Jezebel is. Yes, that's, a, that's about what I was expecting. A few hands, but not many. Their names might ring a bell somewhere in the vague distance. Scripture regards them as some of the worst rulers ever. <laughs> If you've ever heard a lady called a Jezebel, you know it is not a flattering comparison. That person was invoking the book of 1 Kings, probably without even realizing they were doing it. Herman Melville called the primary antagonist of his literary classic Moby Dick, Captain, what? Ahab. He knew what he was doing. Captain Ahab's not a nice guy. Elijah's mission is to call Ahab and Jezebel away from idolatry, away from corruption, away from the worship of false gods, back to faithfulness to the real and true God. And Elijah's job is to oppose them if they will not listen. And as you can imagine, they don't appreciate that very much. So he spends much of his story locked in conflict with them. 
Right before today's passage in 1 Kings 18, Elijah has fought and defeated many of Ahab's followers, the false prophets of Baal. So as we start today's passage, Elijah is coming off a major victory. He should be riding high. Everything should be smooth sailing, right? Wrong. Elijah has dealt a setback to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, but he has not defeated them. And our passage for today begins when Jezebel gets word of what Elijah has done. She sends him a threatening note that basically says, I heard you killed all of Baal's prophets. Either I'm going to be dead by this time tomorrow, or you're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. Now, I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of having your life threatened by another person. Of course, we need to bracket out uh, sibling experiences in childhood, right? As an adult, how many of you have had your lives threatened? It's probably not a very fun experience. And Elijah is brave, but at that moment, his nerve just fails him. He loses his courage. So he runs like a jackrabbit as far away as he can possibly get. The Bible says Elijah journeys from Mount Carmel in the north to Beersheba in the south. Uh, That's a distance of about 120 miles. So it's about as far far from Neighborville to Champaign-Urbana, right? It's quite a way to go. The Bible doesn't tell us he rode horseback or anything, so he's journeying on foot as far as we know. As if that's not far enough, Then he leaves his servant behind in the city and he goes a day out into the wilderness, into the desert, into the middle of nowhere. He finds a little desert shrub, he collapses under it, and he pours out his disappointment and despair to God. I've had enough, God. Take me now. I'm ready to go. We're done here. And in response, God sends an angel to visit Elijah. And you can only understand the significance of what happens next if you also understand what doesn't happen. The angel offers Elijah bread and water. That's it. God doesn't call down fire from heaven like he'd done one chapter before. He doesn't send a pillar of fire to keep Elijah company in the wilderness like he did for Moses and the Israelites in the book of Exodus. He doesn't send him a mystical vision like he does the apostle Paul. He just sends a loaf of bread and a jug of water. And then Elijah takes a nap. Elijah is on the baby schedule in this passage of scripture. He wakes up, he eats, he drinks, and he goes back to sleep. Then he wakes up and he eats and drinks and then he goes back to sleep. That's the story. So what's the message here? What does this have to say to us? Well, there's several things I think this passage has to teach us. First, it teaches us that spiritual highs and spiritual lows often come together. Second, it teaches us to acknowledge our human limits And third, to take the long view. I'm going to talk about each of those things in turn. So first, this story teaches us that spiritual highs and spiritual lows often come together. What do I mean by that? By a spiritual high, I mean a special sense of being close to Jesus, of his presence, of doing exactly what God wants us to do and of his power and protection. This can happen any number of places or situations. It can happen during a particularly powerful church service, during a small group meeting, a time of serving others in Christ's name. For many of us, going on a retreat can be a very powerful experience of a spiritual high. Right before this passage, Elijah has an incredible spiritual high. He faces down the prophets of Baal in a public contest and he beats them. And he not only beats them, he sends them running away with their tail between their legs. He must have had a profound sense of being close to God, of doing his will, of serving his cause. 
A spiritual low is the exact opposite of all that. A spiritual low often happens when we're trying to do God's will and things are difficult. The path is more challenging than we thought. Our abilities are more limited than we thought. There's more opposition than we anticipated from outside of us. We might feel frustrated or discouraged or want to quit. Sometimes there's a sense that God is far from us, that we can't hear his voice or feel his presence. During a spiritual low, it's very common to experience temptation, to anger, to sadness, discouragement, or doubt. We begin to wonder if the work we're doing is really God's will and if God is really with us after all. Elijah, in today's passage, experiences a profound spiritual low. The enemy he thought he had defeated is very much still alive and kicking. His life is threatened. He loses his nerve. He finds himself alone and exhausted in the middle of nowhere. What I want you to see is that the spiritual high and the spiritual low come right after one another. They're in sequence. And that's often how these things come. Many of us have had that sort of experience. You come to church on Sunday, and the sermon seems like it's speaking directly to you. You're inspired and encouraged, and you promise yourself, I'm going to take some of this wisdom I got at church, and I'm going to share it with my family, or I'm going to bring it to work with me on Monday, and they're going to love it. And then you go home, and you share it with your family, and it falls flat, right? The ideas that seem so generative and life-giving to you kind of bounce off other people. Your spouse changes the subject, Your boss yawns. You had a spiritual high, and now there's a spiritual low. A couple months ago, I preached a sermon on uh, taking your faith with you to work, and I got a hilarious text from a friend of mine on Tuesday that week, a member of this church. She said, Dave, I was really inspired by your sermon, and I really uh, made a vow to myself that I was going to bring Jesus with me to work, and it lasted until 9.30 a.m. on Monday. Because my first client of the week was a total jerk. (laughs) Spiritual high, spiritual low. You volunteer to serve on a great banquet team. And it's an amazing weekend filled with the Spirit's presence. And then next Sunday rolls around. And you come back to church looking for more of that amazing feeling. But something seems missing. The sermon doesn't quite land. The hymns aren't your favorite. The choir seems to be singing off key. You've had a spiritual high, and now there's a spiritual low. Our choir never actually sings off key. I hope you understand. Yeah, I'm not trying to start a fight. Back when I was getting my PhD, I often experienced a version of this phenomenon. At the end of the semester, I would do what all academics do. I would burn the candle at both ends to finish up my term papers. I'd spent whole days super glued to my couch, rarely moving except to consult some weighty tome. I'd sprint to the end of the semester, I'd turn in my papers, and then what happened? I would experience a low. My papers suddenly seemed asinine rather than intelligent. My theological insights were pretentious and not profound. I started to wonder if I was really called to get my doctorate at all. I would want to jump right back into my normal routine of caring for the kids and going to church, but I was just too tired and depleted. Of course, it was my wife who finally identified this pattern in my life and who had the wisdom to suggest that I needed to build in a day or two to recover at the end of each term. Somehow, when I knew the low was coming, it disarmed it somewhat. I I would prepare for it, I'd spend a day or so sleeping and praying and going on long walks, and gradually it would pass. So as you hear this story of Elijah, the first thing to remember is that spiritual highs and spiritual lows often come together. And the next time you have a spiritual high or you're preparing to have one, be aware that a low might be around the corner. 
Elijah struggles in part because this low catches him by surprise. He has this enormous victory and that's gets caught off guard by the resistance he experiences after it. As we grow in wisdom and experience in the Christian life, we'll be able to start anticipating those lows more and more. We may still struggle, but we won't be as surprised. The first lesson in this passage is that spiritual highs and spiritual lows come together. The second lesson this story teaches us is to acknowledge our human limits. What do I mean by that? At this point in the story, Elijah has been intensely serving God for quite some time. He's performed miracles, he's faced down prophets, and now he's traveled over 100 miles on foot in a matter of a few days. He's exhausted. He has come up against his human limits, his basic need for food and rest. And God, in his wisdom, knows that and provides him exactly what he needs. Some of you remember the sermon on Jonah, the sermon series on Jonah that Darren preached a few months ago. If you remember the last chapter of Jonah, the end of Jonah, Jonah says exactly the same thing that Elijah says here. He says, God, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm dead, take my life. I'm ready to be finished, right? In the fourth chapter of Jonah, God says, come on, Jonah, get it together. Pull yourself together, right? God rebukes Jonah, even though Jonah says the exact same thing. Here, God doesn't rebuke Elijah. God's first and primary response to Elijah is what? Get up and eat and drink. Because God knows what Elijah needs. He tells him to eat some food and drink some water and get some rest. Right after this passage... There's another famous story, the story of the still small voice. Many of you will recognize that term, God speaks to Elijah in a still small voice. Isn't it interesting that God doesn't speak to Elijah right away? You'd think, okay, Elijah's out there in the wilderness, he's depressed, he's anxious, he's discouraged. Surely God would would right in that moment come up to him and say, listen, Elijah. But he doesn't. It's almost as though God knows that trying to speak to Elijah would be pointless unless his basic physical needs are met first. If you and I want to hear God, if we want to hear that still small voice, we could do way worse than to take a page from Elijah's book and make sure we get plenty of rest and we have healthy food. Now, of course, sometimes serving Jesus is going to stretch us. It's going to challenge us, physically and otherwise. We're going to get up at the crack of dawn to serve folks breakfast at Hesed House. We're going to go on the youth retreat, and we're going to see kids learn more and more about Jesus and get so little sleep. That's good. The problem arises only when we ignore our basic needs for a long period of time. This can be particularly challenging in the church, right? Sometimes people think that when we're serving Jesus, we should never stop, never take a break, never take a Sabbath. I once heard a story about a man who was giving his pastor a hard time for taking a day off every week. And he said, well, pastor, you know, the devil never takes a Sabbath. And the pastor just looked at him and smiled and said, well, if I never took a Sabbath, I would be just like the devil. This passage shows us something that's so important. It shows that God respects Elijah's physical needs. And it's an invitation for us to do the same for ourselves and for others. So ask yourself, how am I doing at giving myself patterns of work and rest? Times to hit the gas and times to pump the brakes. Am I taking care of myself? Physically, am I getting adequate rest and exercise and eating well? Am I taking care of myself spiritually? Do I have times where I pour out for others and I receive for myself? Where in your life might God be saying to you, get up and eat? That's the second thing. 
God respects Elijah's physical needs. My third point is this. This passage teaches us to take the long view. To take the long view. What do I mean by that? When the angel speaks to Elijah, he says the same thing in two different ways. So the first time, the angel says simply, get up and eat. The second time, the angel adds something. The angel says, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. For the journey is too much for you. It's as though the angel is saying, listen, buddy, uh, I know you walked a long ways to get here. You actually have even further to go. So be sure you eat, right? Like a parent with their child before a road trip, this will be the last time we stop to use the bathroom between here and Kentucky. So go now, okay? Angel's doing something similar. The angel is looking at Elijah's struggles with an eye to the long view. This isn't just about the 200-mile journey between the desert of Beersheba, where Elijah is, and Mount Horeb, where he eventually winds up. It's about the long ministry journey in front of him. And the angel is helping Elijah recalibrate and look at his ministry with a longer-term view. Which is the biblical pattern. God wants us to enlist in his service for the long run. He may assign us particular tasks for a brief moment, a day or a week, but most often, he wants us to work over years. Think of Moses, who worked for the Lord his whole life, including 40 years in the wilderness. Think of Jeremiah, who ministered in Jerusalem for 40 years. Think of saints like Peter and Paul, who spent their whole lives working for Jesus. When you think of your work for God in terms of years or even decades, you are free to take the long view. Sometimes in the church, we buy into this very American idea that we can fix some problem quickly, that all it will take is two hours or two days or two weeks and everything will be tied up nice and easy with a pretty little bow. Well, God can work miracles and sometimes it does work like that. But more often, in my experience, God invites us to be part of a team effort that stretches over years or decades. And our job is to be faithful to the work day in, day out, whether or not it is greeted by instant success or with some setbacks. Elijah's ministry in the Old Testament bears this out. Elijah doesn't so much defeat Ahab and Jezebel as he just outlasts them. He doesn't have a dramatic confrontation with them that ends with their death. He just keeps being faithful. He keeps showing up. He keeps opposing them. He keeps telling the truth. And after many years, they're defeated. Ahab winds up listening to some of those false prophets who tell him to go into battle against a foreign king when he shouldn't do that. He goes into battle and he's killed. And then another king comes onto the throne and promptly executes Jezebel. It's all rather anticlimactic. This wisdom is echoed by the history of Christian movements of social change. Abolitionists who fought against slavery worked in relative isolation for decades until the Civil War broke out and brought an end to it. Christians of many ethnicities were working for an end to Jim Crow racism for decades before Martin Luther King came along. On a perhaps more modest note, I think of our mission partners. People like Mike Trout, who started Y-Men on the west side of Chicago many decades ago. He's been working there with fruitfulness Since then, in season and out of season. That's the kind of commitment God wants from us. I often feel best about my work for the kingdom when I can fix something, when I can make a tangible contribution right away. There's nothing wrong with that. But the church often is called to tackle big problems, problems that require the long view, problems that might take years to begin to change, problems affecting not just people, but institutions or cultures. 
And there's a kind of relief in taking the long view. It means that no matter what obstacles or difficulties we may encounter, no matter what setbacks we may face, we just keep going. We pursue the work God has given us to do here at church or out in the world with a gentle implacability, a wholesome relentlessness that makes us useful tools in the hands of God. When I served my first church down in Bloomington, Illinois, one of my key leaders was a wonderful Christian man named Paul. He was a person of very deep faith, He was a great banquet leader himself, and he was very active on our adult discipleship team. He was always trying to help people at church grow in faith um, by picking up a discipline of prayer, by reading the Bible, by joining a small group. He was a wonderful co-worker in Jesus Christ. And for a variety of reasons, the work we did on the adult discipleship team together was very challenging. Uh, It was kind of a one step forward, two steps back kind of situation. We'd try things and they'd work for a little while and then they would stop working. And as a young idealistic pastor, I went through seasons of real frustration at that church. I would think, oh, gosh, darn it. Why can't I get this right? We can't make any progress in the right direction, blah, 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 blah. And one month I came to a council meeting. And Paul was there, and I was just about ready to throw in the towel. I was so discouraged and disappointed. And there's Paul, and he acknowledges all of our recent setbacks very forthrightly. He says, yeah, that didn't work. No, that didn't work either. And then he just says, well, what if we tried this other thing, X, Y, and Z? And I don't know what it was about that situation, but his attitude ministered to me because I saw what it was to take the long view of the kingdom of God. And I realized in that moment that Paul had been working for the kingdom of God at that church for many years, and he would continue to work for the kingdom of God at that church for many years in the future. That if and when I left that church, he would still be there. He would still be faithful. He would still be showing up to work. He would not tire. He would not get discouraged. He would not quit. He would not turn away. He would not shirk his task. He was faithful. He had the gentle implacability of the kingdom of God. He had the long view of God's kingdom. And I walked out of that meeting whistling a happy tune because I knew that even though our short-term efforts might have been frustrated, that that ministry was in good hands, that it was in God's hands. There's a freedom that comes with taking the long view. Dear friends, let's learn from Elijah. Spiritual highs and lows come together, that God honors our physical needs, and that we are free to take the long view. And most of all, remember as we come to Holy Communion today, remember that God is saying to all of you, get up and eat. God is inviting all of you to come and be nourished at his table and be turned loose in the world.